so enjoy. Um, today, Laura Lacrona and Renata Klein will be talking about Women as Wounds, book, book by Janice Raymond. Um, and before we start, I just want to make one announcement is that there is no meeting next week because of the holiday. I will also post that in the chat. Um, Renata and Laura, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Marion. So, Renate, do, do you want to start? I thought Marion was introducing us, but am I wrong? Um, I just did. I don't. You, I don't know if you um, missed that. Oh, but okay. I did introduce right. you, so everyone knows who you are now. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Women as Wombs is one of my favorite books. And so it was fantastic to be able to um, reread it and then talk about it. I was working very closely with Jan Raymond in FINRAID, which is a fem feminist international network of resistance to reproductive and genetic engineering during the time she wrote Women as Wombs. Jan was also doing columns called At Issue for the journal that we produced at the time, which was called um, Reproductive and Genetic Engineering. And most of these columns are actually still available on the FinRage site, which is www.finrage.org. Um, together with Robin Rollins, Living Laboratories, which I show you here, uh, published a year earlier, Women as Wombs is an incredible book that has not dated and needs to be read or reread to understand the ongoing misogynist and anti-feminist theory and practice underpinning reproductive technologies, especially IVF and surrogacy, that bring so much harm and misery to women. What struck, struck me very much about Jan's book when I reread it is, was the strong language. I think we have all become a bit too polite with the increasing number of men, gay and otherwise, whinging about their absolute need to see their genes manifested in a baby that is grown and carried by a breeder. No, not yet an artificial womb, but a real life woman called gestational carrier or surrogate. Jan would just call them spermatic source or ejaculatory father simple and precise. Now, Lara and I will be talking, taking turns discussing the introduction and six chapters of this book. But first, Lara, what is your connection to Women as Wombs and Jan Raymond? Um, well, um, I, I don't remember how I found out this book existed. But um, let me let me tell you uh, when was the first time I heard about the reproductive reproductive technique of surrogacy. It was maybe twenty years ago, from two lesbian friends who were friends with a wealthy gay couple who had made themselves a baby to order. They had inseminated the egg of the sister of one of them with semen from the other one and had it implanted under a domestic worker. So the woman who had put the egg was the aunt of the child of which she could claim biological motherhood. And the woman who gestated it and gave birth to it would be the nanny. One was supposed to be happy because this gay couple could have their very own baby and parent it. But of course, I didn't feel happy at all something felt very, very odd. As a loving aunt myself, I, Im I imagined I put myself the, in, in the awkward position of the aunt who was rather the mother and the nanny who was in fact the mother but could never ever dream to say so. I felt very uncomf uncomfortable, but in those days, I couldn't explain my discomfort using the word exploitation and the feminist and the radical feminist language. Um, I remembered this years later when Spanish feminists, maybe four or five years ago, when Spanish feminists were in a fierce struggle against the regulation of surrogacy in their country, while prominent Mexican liberals 
who had fought for abortion rights were now promoting surrogacy as if it was the logical consequence and as if it was a very good thing for women. So listening to feminists such as Alicia Millares and the group No Somos Vasijas, We Are Not Vessels, I familiarized myself with the main feminist and ethical arguments against sur surrogacy. But then I read them in this book published 25 years earlier. It was amazing how Janice Raymond had been such a visionary, not only on the transsexual issues with her book, The Transsexual Empire, published in 1979, but on surrog surrogacy as well. When what she saw and analyzed 30 and 40 years ago and was somewhat incipient back then are gigantic problems nowadays. Um, I also found interest in this book because she's a philosopher specialized in bioethics. I wish I, wished I had known this book when I was in the university and started interesting myself in bioethics and medical ethics. But I read about other problems, not surrogacy. It was, this was 30 years ago. And, and Renate, I wanted to tell you, it's amazing li listening to you, to your first hand account. I knew you were an editor, as you are an editor, as I am. But even though I had read Women as Wombs a few years ago, I didn't remember you are a bi biologist as well. And I wasn't aware you were already investigating into these issues more than 30 <laughs> years ago. You, no, are no, quoted, no. you are quoted and, and acknowledged in this book, and you co author an article by, with Janice Raymond, Lynette Dumbo, and you are mentioned, it is mentioned in the notes. So, so it is great that you are uh, uh, speaking about this book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, no, no. I'm a real dinosaur, you know. So, so when when I be, began being interested in in these in these uh, subjects, um, I found this book. I also found your own your very own surrogacy and human rights violation, and Kaksaki Segman's book, Being and Being But. But th there were not many more available back then, four or five years ago. But there there are several who have been published since then. But these were the main. The main books are, I read when I, as I told you, became interested in it. I founded in Mexico a, a small group, uh, Mexicans against, uh, against the Renting of Wombs, FEMBA, Feministas Mexicanas Contra Vientres de Alquiler. And we, we uh, something we accomplished back then was make the public, uh, mainly the feminists, aware that this was a feminist issue, but the, the, the feminist uh, position was to be against it because it's not in, 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 uh, we can we as feminists cannot be for the reproductive exploitation of women and this book makes it very clear how much of an exploitation the, it is so that's right yeah yeah mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. That's really interesting. So now let me begin with the introduction. I'm going to say quite a bit about the introduction, um, not as much later after the other chapters, because the introduction really actually sets out very well what Jan wants to do in this book. So let me begin with a strong quote from this introduction, which she says, this book is a challenge to medicalized reproductive fundamentalism that reduces infertility to a disease and promotes the new reproductive technologies and contracts as a cure. Jan continues to spell out that because all these technologies, drugs and procedures violate the integrity of a woman's body in ways that are dangerous, destructive, debilitating and demeaning, quote, they are a new form of medical violence against women and that some of them, such as surrogacy, create a traffic in women's bodies, mostly across international borders. And she continues, and I, I do remind you, this was written in 1993. She continues, in challenging these procedures as reproductive choice, this book calls into question the, go the going version of procreative liberty and denies 
that these technologies liberate women. And further, this book is also about language. I highlight the political consequences of calling real mothers, quote, surrogate or substitute mothers and calling ejaculatory sperm sources fathers. I discuss a medical discourse that identifies women as, quote, alternative reproductive vehicles and, quote, maternal environments and, quote, human incubators. Technological and contract reproduction degenderizes language and pro procreation as if women were not involved at all. And finally, Jan also emphasizes that in this book, she highlights, quote, the connections between sexuality and reproduction in an attempt to bring together sexual and reproductive politics. I think this is a really important point, which nowadays I think we have forgotten, and more on this in a minute. What Jan also wants to do in this book is to make public radical feminist work on the new reproductive technologies, which was and still is effectively censored in both the main, mainstream media and the mainstream feminist press. In her words, this book gives voice to these censored protests and are chronicled the most powerful and successful feminist responses and challenge to these technologies. Furthermore, she makes the important point that we must talk about people's supposedly biological needs to reproduce instead of talking about them as personal and social relationship. Here's a quote. When male claims to children are asserted, as in surrogacy disputes, we hear about men's right to quote, genetic fulfillment. When new reproductive technology procedures are launched for public acceptance, we hear about, quote, women's natural need to reproduce. Patrick Steptoe, lab parent of the fir world's first IVF baby, Louis Brown, born in 1978, asserted, quote, it is a fact that there is a biological drive to reproduce. Women who deny this drive or in whom it is frustrated show disturbance in other ways. Now, maybe you think this is outdated, but I don't think so. Um, in fact, today, more so than in 1993, any woman who cannot conceive is now assumed to go for IVF treatments, five or 10 of them, or as long as the money lasts. And then if there's still no success, it's off to surrogacy. This is how the escalation has taken place in 30 years. Jan Remen challenges this natural urge as a political point scoring, nothing natural about them. She likens it to prostitution and says, quote, as feminists, we have attacked the false essentialism that the male sexual urge is uncontrollable and therefore men need prostitutes to satisfy their sexual needs. So two feminists oppose the idea that reproduction is a biological imperative. As mentioned earlier, Janice Raymond calls reproductive technologies medical violence against women. And she adds, I maintain in this book that much of technological reproduction is brutality with a therapeutic face. And again, I couldn't agree more. Just think of heartbreaking stories from IVF land where women are harmed and messed around for years, often, of course, with no baby at the end, at the, at the end because Let's not forget that the current honest success rates of IVF are no, no more than 25%. Women's wombs also cover surrogacy. Here Jan says, surrogate contracts are not simple, simply in individual arrangements between women and supposedly desperate couples. They are reproductive purchase, purchase orders where women are procured as instruments in a system of breeding. This is another instance of wonderful, strong language. I will try and remember these words. Hopefully we all will. One of the strongest links for me in this introduction is the link Chan makes between reproduction and sexuality. And I quote, reproduction is the consequence of man's sexual access to women. Reproductive abuse of women's bodies is accepted as normal. 
because sexual abuse has paved the way. Women are required to spread their legs too frequently for medical probing and penetration under the guise of scientific advancement. And she adds, in the spermatic economy of sex and breeding, oh, wonderful, women exist for sex. She also exists to become pregnant and reproduce when and if men want children. There is but a short distance from fucking to breeding in the patriarchal picture. Whether as sexual object or reproductive instrument, uh, women are there to give to men. When women cannot serve as natural reproductive instruments or when men cannot perform their natural, natural fertilizing role, the great technological fuck takes over. <laughs> I truly love this language, the great technological fuck takes over. Again, you know, would anybody write this today? I think we've got them too, too polite. Coming back to the earlier mentioned connection between sexuality and reproduction that I think we have forgotten about today, Jan Raymond tells us an intriguing anecdote about Jack, Jack, Jack Testar of French IVF fame, who compares um, his intellectual success to an intellectual orgasm. Testar writes of his, quote, incestuous feelings for his IVF child, Amandine, Francis, Francis first test your baby. And he says, I invented my, I invested myself in a role that was not paternal. I felt I was the lover, not the father. I would like to be, to discover her once she's become a person. That's why I see myself more as a lover and not the father. Extraordinary stuff. And as Jan continues, his assumption of fatherhood is questionable enough. More outrageous is his candid admission of sexual fantasy with an egg called uh, egg slash fetus slash baby. He clearly matches matchings as his lover. Testar also makes clear that the technologies are about penetration. And we don't talk about that anymore. And she continues with a very important point. Increasingly, there is a pornography of pregnancy in which women's pregnant bodies, prone bodies, bodies on all fours with ass in air ready for embryo implantation, that's how they do it, and bodies with legs up and, and head down are all portrayed on national TV to show the public how IVF works. This is educational pornography. Women in the graphic state of technological manhandling for all the world to see. As sociologist Jana Hammer, also a FinRage member, has stated, at last I have discovered what the term motherfucker means and who the motherfuckers are. We really do need to remember these words and the connection. Then Chan delves into postmodernism, which was the newly promoted in thing in the early 90s. I'll have to go over, uh, no, can't go into this, but she does say, in the postmodernist world of social criticism in which essays, books, and conference papers have taken on the role of distance commentary, it is my hope that this book will be a dose of reality. Fem feminism is only real if it is continuously involved in women's lives. And I will finish my remarks about this fabulous introduction to women as rooms with Jan's final passage in, in the introduction. She says, this book is the result of years of working internationally as an activist with women from different countries against the development and legalization of many of these technologies. In the course of this work, I have come to know many women whose lives have been ravaged by the techniques, ex-surrogates who have had the courage to testify in public fora, women who have gone through IVF programs and have experienced physical harms and false hopes, and women who have been sterilized and subjected to contraceptive abuse. This book is also the result of an academic life, a good portion of which has been spent documenting in the most rigorous way I know the liabilities of these technologies for women. It is my hope that this book will bring together the work of both documentation advocacy to demonstrate how and why 
reproductive fundamentalism and its product, reproductive technologies and contracts are more peril than progress. And all I can add is that this book does a lot of this and more. Now, Laura, before you go into chapter one, do you have any more thoughts on this brilliant, brilliant introduction? Uh, yes, Renate, uh, uh, there's something I, I, I'd like to to highlight as well uh, from the introduction. Uh, when, when Janice Raymond mentions some beliefs and principles basic to the system of technological reproduction, the first of which is, I quote, that infertility is a disease for which reproductive technology is the remedy. So when I reread re this, uh, I remembered in Mexico, there's a surrogacy bill, which in fact defines infertility as a disease and also posits the existence of something called relational infertility, which afflicts homosexual couples who cannot procreate. And of course, in this bill, they interpret the constitutional right of having as many children as one decides as the right to have children no matter what, even if yeah. they have to exploit a woman in order to meet this, this so-called necessity. And uh, another fundamental principle operating in the defense of technological reproduction, writes Raymond, is, as you, as you said, Renate, that persons have a biological need to reproduce. And there's something else I want to say, even though Janice Raymond doesn't use the T word in this whole book, I'm sure she was aware of several analogies with the transsexual empire while, while writing about the medical establishment which pushes reproductive technologies, as when she says in the introduction, the new reproductive technologies represent an appropriation by male scientific experts of the female body. We, yeah. we nowadays are, are, are witnessing a, 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 an appropriation of this kind, but well, we, uh, magnified by, 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 by this backlash we are, we, are, we are living right now. So the, the, the first chapter, the, it's called uh, infertility, the production of fertility and infertility, east and west, south and north. In Mexico, as I'm sure in many other countries, one hears a repeated accusation to feminists who oppose surrogacy and prostitution. They say we are privileged white feminists. Do they really believe women from impoverished countries are willing to be pregnant and and to give birth to babies, they will then put in the hands of privileged white males? Well, this chapter shows the politics behind reproductive medicine and reproductive technology. Dennis Raymond says fertility and infertility are created and commodified as medical problems. Moreover, in the East, the problem is fertility while in the West, the problem is infertility. But in the end, it's all about population control. Uh, the research, the medical research, be it for new contraceptives or for in vitro fertilization and other techniques used in combination with it, is unethical. There's lack of informed consent, relevant information is withheld, complications are not disclosed. Uh, Janice Raymond uh, writes uh, in some length about uh, something which happened in Bangladesh in the 80s with a contraceptive implant called Norplant, which was being introduced. But many feminists in Bangladesh protested the trials because of, quote, their unethical experimentation on poor, vulnerable women who are used as guinea pigs for international contraceptive research and who are the recipients of an unsafe contraceptive method being used for population control. End of quote. In this chapter, Raymond also denounces the alliances between population control groups and women's health activists and organizations. There's a term we often hear nowadays, reproductive health. 
here in this book, Jaymond points to the moment when this new speak term for family planning was launched, writes Raymond. Population planners are capable of assimilating the language of feminism, which they then use to bolster, not change, their practices. Here lies the basic problem inherent in the collaboration between population planners and feminists or slash women's health activists, end of quote. The public at large doesn't distinguish between them. The, 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 this assimilation of the language of feminists has been very effective for them. The fact that these health activists have been instrumental in the, decriminaliz in the decriminalization of abortion makes matters worse. Uh, because they 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 conflict, no. You are you are um, you defend women's rights to, to abortion, right to abortion. Then you have to defend uh, women's so-called right to choose surrogacy. The the most interesting the, the chapter is lengthy, and of course I, I cannot. It is very rich. It is there there are uh, 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 um, many many great arguments, but uh, I cannot. Uh, uh, talk about them all, but the most interesting argument in this chapter, in, in my opinion, is this. When people see infertility as a disease, some women suffer, quote, says Raymond, from a rather unusual disease, sterility that exists in another person, a male partner. They, these women, are unable to become pregnant because their partner's sperm is low in quantity and motility. There is no medical indication that they, these women, need treatment, yet they, not the male partners, undergo the in vitro fertilization procedure. This all happens so that his sperm and sluggish sperm can mate with her harvested eggs in the petri dish only to be surgically implanted later, later on in her uterus. So I, I think this is this is great. This is the most interesting in, in, in the sense that is it is very original. I had not read this anywhere else, and but 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 it's true. How 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 how, how curious? No, she's she she has a disease, but because of the sterility in someone else in someone else. It's it's brilliant, I think. And there's uh, every liberal feminist, I think every li liberal feminist should read the conclusion of this chapter, <laughs> which reads like this. Those who advocate technological reproduction, claiming sympathy for the infertile, fail to extend that same sympathy to the thousands of third world women who are rendered strategically infertile by mass sterilization contraceptives, and sex predetermination, as in India. It is a sympathy based on an ideology of reproductive liberalism, liberalism that neutralizes the violation of women that is inherent in these technologies. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. That's a really good summary. And um, uh, it's really important, as Jan points out, that you know you we we always look at the two sides of the coin. You know, infertility, so-called treatments for women in the West, and sterilization for women in the in the South. And again, I think at the moment we we seem to still focus on the uh, need, especially in, in the case of surrogacy, to have babies. But what we have forgotten is the harmful contraceptive contraceptives that are still being applied especially to African women at the moment and we desperately need to go back to that and look always at the two sides of the coins and we in Finright really did that that was really important that we had women like Farida Akhtar from Bangladesh with us and she was obviously focused on on she was obviously focused on what hap happened to women in Bangladesh and her study that you mentioned on Norkland was really really important now, in chapter two, which is called Maternal Environments and Ejaculatory Fathers, New Definition of Motherhood and Fatherhood. 
Um, in this chapter, Jan Raymond is very critical of equate, equating motherhood with female power, while at the same time, the political power of a new norm of fatherhood grounded in male gametes and genes gains ground in the context of surrogacy. And again, you know, 1993 forward to today, it is even more important today than then. Jan calls this ejaculatory fatherhood and continues. The ejaculator is called a father <laughs> from the very moment that his sperm fertilizes an egg. By dint of fertile ejaculation per se, men are becoming fathers before taking on any parental relationship. And as we have an accepted, quote, spermatic market in which a man's liquid assets will control, it is a political economy, a spermocracy in which male potency is power, exercised politically against the real potency of women, whose far greater contribution and relationship to the child is rendered powerless. How true is that today? If you think of all the surrogacy story involving gay men that the press showers us with. In contrast to this expansion of father, father rights, she says quite rightly that reproductive technologies deconstruct motherhood in ways that deprive women of even the remnants of mother rights. In her words, quote, for example, when a woman signs a surrogate contract, her motherhood is rend rendered null and void. This chapter also includes a strong rejection of altruism which makes me very happy because I have criticized uh, altruistic surrogacy and I have said that I think it can actually be worse than commercial surrogacy as it exploits women apparently inherent niceness. In Chan's word, it essentializes the altruistic woman. And altruism is so accepted as a positive personal value that few question the way it has been used to legitimate many new reproductive technologies. She explains this further by drawing on Australia's famous or infamous first and actually last for a while, Maggie and Linda Kirkman's sister sister surrogacy in the 1980s. The gestation sister Linda affirmed that it was an act of love and the organizing obstetrician John Leighton added, quote, the driving force was altruism. Therefore, I see it as a very moral and loving act. Australian news, uh, newspaper headlines depicted the IVF surrogacy as a special gift. Noel Keane, a well-known US surrogate broker, used the concept of altruism in his grooming of women to become surrogates in an ed educational video called A Special Lady. In Chan's words, quote, the fil film aims to pimp young women into surrogacy using the appeal of altruism as a seasoning process, a gentle strategy of procurement casting surrogacy as a supreme act of female giving. And she adds the truism, if women were truly lining up to become surrogate mothers out of altruism and concern for the infertile, we would have middle and upper class women bearing the babies of lower class couples where the added gift of aiding those who cannot afford to pay would be an even greater expression of altruism. This, of course, never happens. Jan continues, for women, gift giving is a source of identity, status, and relief from guilt. Women who don't give time, energy, care, sex, are exposed to disapproval or pen penalty. And altruistic reproductive exchanges leave intact the status of women as a breeder class, whether, whether for producing eggs, fetal tissue or babies. Women's bodies are still the raw material for others needs, desires and purposes. It is all so, so true. And she ends this chapter by stating, quote, reproductive self-determination must be founded on women's achieving basic control in every area of their lives. Most basically, the right and ability to choose if they want children, when and under what conditions. Feminist advocacy of reproductive self-determination worldwide cannot merely point 
for the uses and abuses of the new reproductive technologies alone. It must advocate as part of the content of such self-determination, the option to remain man, marriage and child free. Very wise words. So, um, Lara, you comment on this chapter and then on to chapter three. Yes, Renate. Um, uh, when I reread this, uh, Raymond's broad critique of how women altruism, how women's altruism is used as a justification for the reproductive exploitation, uh, how and how women are supposed to be altruistic, and they are used as reproductive gifts, inevitably comes to mind this male fantasy common amongst men who claim to have a female gender identity of having wombs transplanted into them. Yes. Of, of course, and of course, the first candidates for altruistically donating them, their otherwise useless wombs, in air quotes, are lesbians who claim to have a male identity and undergo hysterectomies. Yep, absolutely. And I'm sure one of these days they will tell us this is an absolute necessity for them, these males. And the saddest, the saddest thing is there will be lesbians willing to indulge them and help them achieve this bodily appropriation about Janice Raymond wrote at length in the transsexual empire. It's, I'm sure it will happen later. I, I, I've seen some of these men already boasting about this, this fantasy. It's, it's, well, it's so enraging. And uh, also this chapter has, has a, a very interesting argument about the, the different, the new definitions of motherhood and fatherhood. And she says, um, I, I'm not sure if I, I can uh, convey it as well as she does here, but uh, in 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 the in ancient Greece, Greece, the the important thing to claim to be a parent was the sperm, the the the, the ejaculatory parent, the ejaculatory father was the father because the woman was only a vessel. This means the the genetic the the genetic element was the important one, and then when when the criteria for saying someone is uh, some woman is the mother is the egg, this this is making the motherhood important by way of the genetic element, not not the gestational um, uh, part of it, so to say. So so it's the the, the mother is important in in. Uh, uh, how, how to say, in as much as it is uh, similar to the to the sperm, which is the important thing. But the egg is important only if it is uh, in accordance with the sperm, so, so to say. If the egg and the sperm are, are are not aligned, then the egg doesn't doesn't matter at all. And this is this is exemplified in some court cases, which Janice Raymond mentions. When the when the father was given the 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 how do they say when there's a divorce and they the um, what's the word do you know when when there's a divorce and somebody has to keep the children and there's this this legal term for um, custody custody yeah they give the custody to the man. And the, the, uh, the, a woman who just states another, uh, uh, the, the, the baby for which she get, then gives or sells to another one cannot claim motherhood. But sometimes the woman who gave the egg can claim motherhood. But if, 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 if there's, a, there's an example here, if there's a man who gave the sperm and he claims parenthood, he claims fatherhood, uh, and this against the, the the woman who gave the egg. For example, if if she wants, it, it was a case about uh, fertilized embryos. She wanted to the woman 
uh, wanted to use them even after she was di divorced from the man who gave the sperm. But the man doesn't want the man wants them to be destroyed. The judges uh, uh, gave the reason to the um, uh, uh, the the father won the case because then even though there was the egg, but the sperm the sperm prevailed, so to say. I'm sorry if it, if it, uh, it if I wasn't clear enough, but read this. Uh, I, I tell to the public read the second chapter. It, it's amazing. It's brilliant. This this argument is. I, I hadn't read it in any in anywhere, and I haven't read it anywhere else since. But but it it's it's sophisticated, yes, but it's brilliant. Um. So and chapter three which is called a critique of reproductive liberalism uh, includes the richness as, as all the other chapters the richness of arguments against the dominant claims from liberal feminists defending surrogacy nowadays particularly those who think the right to choose brandished to defend the right to abortion extends so dramatically to surrogacy as some theoretical right to choose being exploited to fulfill the desire of other people to have babies. And says Raymond, quote, the right to equality, the right to procreate, and even the right to choose what to do with one's own body, fail to address the underlying structure of male dominant social relations in which certain women are created as a breeder class and where women are commodified as reproductive beings to be bought and sold in the spermatic marketplace. Moreover, and this is another quote, pro-choice has become the rallying cry of women's and reproductive rights groups in the United States today, and this is in 1983, and in Mexico as well, I might add, not pro-woman, but pro-choice, as if the latter might attract those who are not certain about their commitment to women's rights, but are indeed committed to the quintessential American value of choice. Reliance on choice, especially as promoted by women's groups, lacks not only vision, but honesty." End of quote. And Raymond, in this book, doesn't talk about gay couples resorting to surrogacy because in 1983, this was not a thing. But rereading this chapter, I kept remembering this cry, get the L out, you know, get the lesbian out of LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, Q, etc. The GBT, the GB, the gay, bisexual, and trans are so liberal and so anti woman. So many, I, 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 I thought about this, the, the, those bisexual men who in the 80s were and were married and transmitted HIV to their unknowing wives, which didn't, who, who didn't know they were bisexual in the, first, uh, um, in the first place. And so many gay men who are so happy to exploit impoverished women and use them as vessels to fulfill their wishes. And don't get me started on the tea. But these liberal feminists tell us, oh, no, no, we have always supported the LGBTQ movement. My goodness, no, the, I didn't see it as clearly as I do now, five or seven years ago. But my goodness, what a misogynistic movement that is. And let's get the L out. Yes. And that that's my summary and, and and reflections about this this chapter this chapter three ah this was your chapter so now uh, now it's turn uh, I'll talk a bit about the chapter four which is ah uh, no 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 this was a critique of reproductive lib oh no chapter three sorry sorry, sorry. <laughs> no I I'm gonna talk I'm gonna talk about chapter four. But ah, yes, you're I, right, you're I right. Just want to add, I just want to add, Laura, to what you said about that chapter. Um, that chapter actually gave, uh, gave Jan the most grief of this whole book. And um, 
this, a lot of what is in chapter about the sexual liberalism was also published in the journal that I mentioned at the beginning. And I happened to be in Berkeley at the time and a woman came rushing up to me and said, I've had it with you now. I've been supportive of Finright, but no more after this column by Janice Raymond. How dare she? Because Jan quite rightly actually had a go at socialist feminists for being a bit like the liberal feminists and talking about choice and all of that. And she really pinpointed them and this woman did not like that. So she got a lot of um, flack for this chapter. It was also a version of it was published in that great book that Sheila also has a chapter in the sexual liber liberals and their um, attack on feminism. So now um, we need to move, I think. So chapter four, the marketing of the new reproductive technologies, medicine, the media, and the idea of progress. Um, Chan starts by saying that um, the media depicts reproductive technologies as miracles, as in the same way that in the 60s and 70s, space programs were talked about. I think that has abated a bit today. Nobody um, talks about space programs either. Maybe I will come back. And she says, quote, humanity is propelled to the edges of an altogether new frontier. Parents will not be not only be able to correct chromosomal abnormalities, but also choose from a list of herit hereditary options, such as blue eyes, blonde hair, high intelligence, physical strength, and even delayed aging. An entire generation of super smart super strong babies is a distinct possibility and futuristic uh, alternatives hold promises of artificial rooms with customized embryos can grow into term. No fuss, satisfaction guaranteed. The reproductive supermarket has arrived. Now Chan also points out that whenever a new miracle technology arrives, the failure of old are forgotten. She mentions the long, long saga of silicone breast implants. I'm sure many of you will remember, but also the story of ERT, now HRT, and I will abbreviate that. Um, ERT called estrogen replacement therapy was very much, very, very popular in the early 60s when uh, Robert Winston uh, wrote his best-selling book, Feminine, for, Feminine Forever. The fact, despite the fact that there were early warning signs that it led to endometrial cancer. But sales only plummeted in the late 1970s when this link was indeed um, shown up in real life and many women did get um, endometrial cancer. But then in the early 1980s, ERT was resurrected as HRT by adding progesterone and sales went up again. In 2002, that is nine years after Women's Wombs was published, a big women's health nurse study pointed out new cancer and cardiological risks and sales plummeted again, only to rise slowly again. And now, of course, as we know, HRT is also used on trans people. As Jan wrote in, 90, in 1993 on HRT, and she's absolutely right and still correct, by mixing estrogen with progestin, the drug companies hope to circumvent earlier warnings about ERT. But many of the questions regarding safety are still unanswered, and the proponents of the combined therapy fail to recognize the absurdity, the absurdity of using one synthetic hormone, progesterone, to combat the ill effects of another synthetic hormone estrogen and I really this is such an important point and this is now what's happening to these trans people who the men who will uh, stay on this estrogen for life and will die prematurely and have many many cancers and other cardiological problems. Um, Chan then also goes on to say that anybody who is skeptical of these technologies are called other dinosaurs or rigid thinkers and she quotes one of my favorite writers, which is Dr. Richard Seed. That's actually his real name. And he had a fertility clinic in Chicago who said, there is no controversy. Forgot this business about that's illegal, immoral and stop and think. We should charge ahead and do it and forget about the moral minority who want to live in the fifth century. The greatest menace to progress, progress is rigid thinking. 
And then in 1998, he also said he was ready to clone children. Luckily, he never got to do that. I couldn't, I actually Googled him. I don't know if he's still alive. He's not in his clinic anymore. Then uh, another very important of this chapter, which I have to um, not, not talk about, is fetal reduction, which is just the most horrible thing. It's uh, when um, uh, there's too many fetuses developing in a woman's body, either because uh, of too many were inserted or because of the um, fertility drugs used to, to many developed. And so uh, guided by ultrasound, the doctor inserts a needle filled with potassium chloride that's sold into the fetal chest cavity, causing this by heart failure. The fetus is eventually absorbed by the woman's body. This morbid, the morbid risk of fetal reduction are many. Women start, can start bleeding or develop infection, causing them danger, premature labor, and the loss of all the fetuses. Um, it's a very, very horrible practice. It is, it continues to be practiced. Nobody raises an eyelid anymore about it. She then asked also the very important about question, why don't we set limits in these technologies? And she asked, quote, so why is there an unmitigated increase in the number of kinds of drugs and technical fixes that are being prescribed for women, especially in the reproductive realm at a time, and again, 1993, when the rest of the planet is being warned about the risks of chemical and technical fixes? Can we be disturbed about chemically fed plants and animals and re remain unconcerned about chemically fed women many of whom take scores of drugs from menstruation to menopause. If environmentalists are quick to recognize the mechanization of nature, why are they so slow to recognize the pathologizing of women's natural bodily processes? Why are synthetic and technological procedures being limited on plants and animals, yet being increased um, in women? And alas, we still have no answers to these questions today. And Chan ends this question with these wise words. Progress ultimately is a moral, social, and political standard not measured by increased medical, medical technical innovation. When the fullness of this standard is ignored and when science and technology separate themselves from this standard, progress is a form of social self-deception, self-deception. The, the corrective to this limited standard of progress cannot come from more reproductive technology, but from a progress that ensures the welfare, not of women only as individuals, but of all women in all areas of the world. And that is one of the wonderful things about this book that she always connects individual women to the collective women as a group everywhere. So Laura, your thoughts? Uh, uh, I think I will pass to to the to chapter five because we we don't have uh, much time left. No, I know but, we have to be through. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is called the international traffic in women, children, and fetuses. It, it, it is it is terrible. It it states the connections between women trafficked for prostitution. Um, uh, children trafficked for for organs, organ trafficking, uh, which some might think it's it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, a mythical thing, but but Janice Raymond shows us some data that that, that demonstrate it is true. It, 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 there are children being trafficked for their organs, and and something. Something very sad. So, some some people think uh, um, adoption might be the solution if you if 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 surrogacy is abolished, uh, but it is very problematic as well the the, the adoption thing because in, 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 there are mafias and there's there's human trafficking as well in this in these private adoption and international adoptions and in fact um uh, reproductive, re reproductive technologies uh, foster this international adoption mafia it's it's incredible but the the most 
sad thing I read in this chapter, and it is that the human cruelty is amazing, uh, says Janice Raymond. Uh, internationally, another facet of the trafficking in women includes the selling of female fetuses while they are still in the womb. In India, a 1986 study by the Joint Women's Program document, documented that parents are selling unborn female children into prostitution. The study claims that, that some deals are made when fetuses are three months old and commanding some price. And when born, most of these girl children are sold into prostitution. Oh. Well, what, what can I say? It, it's, it's very demoralizing. Um, uh, well, um, and what else was I, I going to say about this? Well, um, maybe, maybe as we only have four minutes, Renate, can you say something about the, the last chapter and then I can say something to, to close, which I have here? Yeah, yes, yeah. So the last chapter is called International Human Rights, Integrity and Legal Frameworks. And this is a particularly hard chapter to summarize in a few minutes. And you really do need to read this book. But I'll, I'll try just to say a few, a few po uh, just to put up a few points. She starts by uh, talking liberal laws and juxtaposed them with her own radical feminist laws. And she says, the right to control one's body too often frames the body as a possession and a capital to dispose of as the individual wishes. To say, I own my body is substantially different from saying, I am my body. And in the latter articulation, it becomes the ground of the self that has dig dignity, integrity, and worth not just a use value. And I think this is really something uh, important that we do not say, oh, I can control my body because it's not true, but I am my body and I'll live with my body. Um, now she says, it is my goal to develop a theory of human rights. And this is her term, technological justice for women, grounded in the dignity and the integrity of a woman's person, but say in the context of international uh, rights relation. And she, she really uh, uh, emphasizes that any declaration of rights must be supplemented by a declaration of relations, relations of individuals to each other, which include obligations, responsibilities, and connection. This is, goes back to the theme that I said before, it's not about the self only, but it's about women's as a social, women as a social class and our different selves. She clarifies her point any valorizing of reproductive technologies as help for the infertile only helps sentimentalize women's inequality. It dismisses at the outset gender specific questions such as, why do women bear the burden of these painful, unhealthy and risky technologies? Why are women in the West channeled into mother motherhood as any cost to themselves? Why are women in the third world channeled out of motherhood any cost to, to themselves? very, very important. And she says, we need to rejoin the ethical and the political without it values such as the dignity or integrity of a woman's body have no political meaning and politics has no ethical grounding. Then the next section is called recentering the subject on the need for an ethics of the dignity and integrity for women. But I think I'll go, I'll leave that out. And then she delves into the crucial topic of regulation versus abolition, on which, of course, we all have a view. And she says very wonderfully, regulation is exactly what the supporters and developers of technological repro reproduction want. It functions as quality control rather than as critical challenge. It gives the surrogacy brokers a stable marketing environment and makes the process of surrogacy more convenient. It also gives the IVF clinics a way of quality controlling the success rate so that uh, only the most successful centers survive and competition is aged out. And her conclusion, ultimately in this book, I contend that I want abolition, 
not regulation. Yep, the starting point for the protection of women's bodily integrity is the abolition of technological reproductive by penalizing its vendors and purveyors and by preventing women from being technologically ravaged. But alas, as we know, this has not happened, but we need to keep saying it. Um, then she goes on to say, and a, a, a concrete example, women need an international convention against medical exploitation developed by uh, NGOs that would declare women's right to bodily integrity, support women's established right to human dignity and physical well being, and work to prohibit the expansionism of contractual and technological reproduction. And alas, this too has not happened. And I believe that is even less likely now than it was in 93. The UN has changed for the worse. And as you all know, we now have to fight for survival of the word woman. No doubt, uh, Jan would have ever, or she does actually know, pleased to see that in the new book, which we have just published towards the abolition of surrogate motherhood, oh. a 14 page feminist convention for the abolition of surrogate motherhood is included that we are spreading wide and far. It's never gonna be a UN convention, but we call it a feminist convention. And to give Jan Raymond the last word in the book, no radical feminist believes that legislation itself will bring an end to women's sexual and reproductive subordination. Legislation can often be subverted for male dominant purposes, but regulatory legislation makes that subversion all the more likely. A radical feminist politics takes seriously the need to provide women with a full stop to this battle over women's bodies. A radical feminist politics demands technological justice. That's a very beautiful last sentence. So we almost made it, didn't we, Laura? <laughs> yes, but uh, I, I'd like to say if, some final words. There is there's so much we we had to leave out. Uh, invite the yeah, yeah. women who are here to to read the book, which is published by Spinifex Press. Press. But um, my last words would be a quote. Uh, from you, Renate, you, you wrote in Surrogacy, a Human Rights Violation, which, by the way, somebody, Joe, Joe asked, what is the best modern book on this? Uh, Surrogacy, a Human Rights, a Human Rights Violation by Renate Klein in Spinning Express might be that one. And, and Renate says, we may not be able to finish off the dirty global surrogacy business exploiting vulnerable people anytime soon, but hopefully we can shine some public light on the ruthless operations and also hold a mirror to the faces of those fence sitting wishy-washy harms minimization liberals who could join with us and make our work truly move mountains. <laughs> Thank you, Lara. That's very true. It's very true. <laughs> and I mean that, but but also compared to Jan's strong word, that almost sounds a bit wishy-washy also. <laughs> I have to get stronger. I have to use stronger wording. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's really so annoying. So many women could join us instead of saying, oh, well, 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 you know, this poor gay man. How else oh, yes. can they have babies? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, well, it's, uh, we are four minutes uh, behind the, no, after the hour. So, Maybe we I think we've done remarkably well, Laura. Congratulations to us, uh, really. <laughs> and I, I really can not only say it one more time, please do read this book. It's just such a good read um, because of her very clear thought. And um, she, she uh, as in the Transsexual Empire, and of course, the latest book, you know, the, um, the, the double thing, um, Jan is one of her foremost uh, radical feminist thinker, and we have to be very grateful to her for her life's work. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, is somebody going to say goodbye to us, or do we have to say goodbye <laughs> to everybody? I'm sorry we didn't get the questions. We really tried, but um, we just couldn't.
because we, we have to cut already quite a lot, so, uh, so much in this book. Yes, but, but well, it, it was a pleasure being with you here, Renate, speaking about this book. And you thank too, you. Laura. We should do this in real life at some yeah, point. Yeah, I would love it. <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much, Renata and Laura. I um, appreciate it. That was great. Um, we'll sign off. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.